television series is about creative visions and respect for humanity. Good evening, I'm Bob Rathburn, the Executive Director at Sloss Furnaces National Historic Landmark. It's my pleasure tonight to talk to you about Sloss Furnaces and its importance not only as the national landmark that speaks to the iron and steel industry nationally and internationally, but the importance of Sloss Furnaces here in Birmingham, Alabama and how it helped to found this city. Today Sloss Furnaces is the only one of the 52 furnaces that operate in Birmingham that still exists. It's no longer operational as an iron foundry, but it is operational as a tourist attraction and as a venue where you can bring your family and understand this industry and its contributions that your family and your great-grandparents made to this city and a creation of a new way of life. Birmingham, Alabama is a post-Civil War city created after the Civil War uh, based on the iron and steel industry. During the war they had found that all the raw materials needed to make iron, iron ore, coal and limestone, all occurred geographically in the same formations in this area. When the railroads were built after the Civil War, they came together in what is now downtown Birmingham, giving industrialists a cheap and efficient way to ship the raw materials in and the finished products out. And so Henry Fairchild de Bard Laban took the knowledge of the iron and steel industry and the raw materials, built the first furnace here in Birmingham, and within 10 years, James Withers Sloss founded Sloss Furnaces. So by 1882, 10 years after the founding of the city, Sloss Furnaces is built, and today it's the only one of the 52 furnaces that operated in the Birmingham district that remains for the public to come and visit and to understand our history and the history of our great-grandparents. If you think of those things that define the skyline of a city, think for example of Paris and the Eiffel Tower or San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge, and ask yourself what are those things, what are those institutions that define the skyline of Birmingham, Alabama? And two things come immediately to mind. The statue of Vulcan on Red Mountain and Sloss Furnace's National Historic Landmark. And for the same reason that those other structures represent their cities, Sloss and Vulcan represent Birmingham because they represent the iron and steel industry, the industry upon which this city was founded, and which for its first hundred years defined its very existence. It was, at the turn of the 20th century, one of the major iron producers in the world producing 22% of all of the iron produced in the United States. Sloss Furnaces is an important part of that story. In our future, we want to build a new visitor center to bring visitors to Birmingham and have them understand the importance of what we created here. It's the story of the creation of a new way of life, of a city that didn't exist, but within 30 years of its founding in 1872, was so proud of what it had accomplished that it sent this giant statue of Vulcan to the 1904 World's Fair. Think for a minute what it means for people in just 30 years to have such pride that they're willing to build that statue and send it to the entire world and then realize that not one of those people involved in its creation was born or raised in Birmingham. If I can take just a moment, I'd like to read to you a statement that was written a short time ago that I think really expresses what Sloss Furnaces is really all about. The real story of Sloss Furnaces is the story of entrepreneurship of rebuilding the South after the Civil War and the creation of new ways of life based on an industrial rather than an agrarian economy. It's the story of small farmers, artisans, and former slaves coming together, forming new relationships and creating something entirely new, a magic city where hard work and ability were valued above birth. Throughout its history, Sloss Furnaces has always stood as a beacon of new opportunity. These are the stories that must be told and this project, when complete, will allow us to educate visitors about our families and their roles in creating this new city. By example, we hope to inspire others to reach for their dreams in the same way as our great-grandparents. Most of cultural institutions that I've been associated with, museums or historical programs of one kind or another, suffer from a lack of advertising and public relations. People don't know what we do. People don't know how to access us. It's only through forums like Art Visions that we have the opportunity to get our word out to the public so that they have an opportunity to find out what we do because we do not have, as nonprofits, the sort of advertising budgets that a for profit tourist attraction would have. So, a program like Art Vision is an important part of the community 
in the way in which the cultural and arts community can reach the public. And so I invite you to watch the show and learn more about Sloss Furnaces. Greater visions and the respect for humanity. My name is Billy Gray Fox Shaw. I am Principal Chief of the Achota Cherokee Tribe of Alabama. I'm here to tell you a few things about our tribe. Two of the things that we do to educate our tribal members is our Coleman County Indian Festival once a year where we invite everybody to. Another thing that we have, we all get together in November and have our Echota Thanksgiving Feast. This is held on our tribal land in Coleman County. We'd like to invite anybody that wants to, to join us and be a part of our family. We have tribal members nationwide. Most of all, all the people are in Alabama. Total enrollment is uh, a little over 30,000 people, which makes us the largest tribe in the state of Alabama, one of the largest in the nation. We stress preserving our cultural history and the sites in the state of Alabama. One of the things the Creator gave us was the we are caretakers of this earth. We are the protectors of this earth. The Cherokee culture tells us that, and uh, that's one thing that we stress is protecting Mother Earth because that is our mother, just like our fathers in the sky. So anytime you need to contact our tribe, we do have a home office, our tribal headquarters in Coleman County. You can contact us by calling 256-734-7337. You can fax the tribe at 256-734-7373. Or you can email the tribe at Echota Cherokee Tribe of AL, all in small letters, at yahoo.com. Or you can write the tribe. All your correspondence to the tribe needs to go to the tribal office. Just write Echota Cherokee Tribe of Alabama, 630, County Road 1281, Faultville, Alabama, 35622. You think about things you say because once you've spoken a word, it can't be took back. I love my family, and, I, and uh, the tribe as a whole is a big family, extended family. But I also love all the nations, and I feel like that if we tried hard, we could all be more connected and more uh, caring for one another. If you show respect and honor to other people, you'll receive respect and honor. I'd like to get across to people more than anything about the Cherokee people or the Native people is that we are not what television depicts us to be. TV depicts us as a violent people, when, which we love all people. We love life and we respect all life. We start, we're a very sacred people. I start every day 
thanking Creator for all my blessings. And when I say all my blessings, I have so many people that I love and I have a great capacity to love. And I think that comes from my Indian heritage. You know, we are a blessed people that we can just, we can go out and enjoy everything he's made for us. And there's so many people that just don't have, well, they think they don't have the opportunity or the time to do it. You know, because making money is more important. They hadn't connected with the Mother Earth. They hadn't went out and re-energized when they're feeling down. But I think that's a part, that's a gift from my native side, I believe. But all people have it. The biggest thing is respect. People have lost respect. You've lost, they've lost respect for everything. Everything is part of life. Everything is connected. As long as you respect your, your parents, your mom and your daddy, your grandparents, uh, most of all your wife and kids, and then you can respect yourself. So when you say prayers, I was always taught, you don't pray for yourself, you pray for other people. Somebody else prays for you. But when you respect all that, then, then you can be a better father and a better mother, but you've got to have the respect. It all boils down to respect. You've got to respect everything. You can have your beliefs, but you've got to respect other people's beliefs. You know, it goes back to freedom of religion. Now, we didn't have freedom of religion in this country until 1993. It was 1993 when President Clinton signed the executive order giving us the right to worship in our traditional ways. So there was a lot of respect they wouldn't give to us. But, you know, we, we always try to respect other people. Where we go to a powwow, we respect the right to, to dance, and we, you know, we respect the their regalia, we don't lay hands on them, or we don't touch their stuff without being asked, or, be, you know, we asked everything. You know, you don't do anything without asking. You just don't push your views off on other people. Be respectful. That's the main thing. Be human. That's what we all strive for, to be human beings. That means no man, no woman, no black, no white, no Apache, no Cherokee. One human, human being.
My name is Cassie Sanford and I'm Vice President of Marketing and Development for Habitat for Humanity of Greater Birmingham. And um, my primary responsibility at Habitat is to, to be a liaison between companies and churches and civic groups and just individuals in the community that want to get involved. I think a lot of people want to get involved in their community. They just are not always sure just how to go about that. And it's real easy to get involved with Habitat. Um, people generally just call our office, tell us they're interested in working with us, and then we line them up with whichever volunteer um, service they would like to do. Some of our volunteers work on the construction sites, some of our volunteers help us in the office, and some of our volunteers work at our Habitat outlet store. Volunteers that work on our construction site uh, generally help with house construction, anything from framing to siding to painting to landscaping. And the great thing about Habitat is you don't have to have any construction skills to participate. There are site supervisors on the house site with the volunteers that demonstrate and instruct volunteers on what to do. But one of the great things we do at Habitat is not only build homes with families in need of affordable quality housing, but we also follow up and stay in contact with the families who live in the houses. It's my dream home coming true. I have learned to put in windows. I have learned how to drill. I have learned how to hammer nails. I have learned how to put on roof things. When I do finally move into the Habitat home, I'll know how to fix everything in there, I guarantee you. I've met a lot of good people. I've lot, met a lot of good Christian people. I've also met people from churches, different churches, organizations, who also helped build my home, who were retired gentlemen from another church. And it was just an exceeding blessing to be touched by these people how sincerely blessed I feel God has done this for me. I will always give my time to someone else because I didn't know what the nature of volunteer means. In the future, I plan to volunteer a lot of hours to Habitat. One of the reasons we are so successful at Habitat Birmingham is because of our sponsors and our volunteers. Um, partnerships is the cornerstone to our organization. If it weren't for partnerships, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So we partner with individuals, with churches, with civic groups, um, different foundations, youth groups, just you name it. We have partners from across a whole spectrum of of people and we encounter all different people from all different walks of life. The children talk about what an impact it makes in their lives. Uh, the fact that they now have a house that they feel safe in, a house that is, is comfortable for them to live in, to come home from school each day. And I've seen the children walking down the street early in the morning to the bus and have often thought to myself about what a what a great blessing it is for those families, for those moms and dads to know that their children can safely come out of their homes, enjoy the, the playing in the yard and, and, and walk to the bus stop and catch the bus for school and then come home happy and excited about being at home, at their very home. And I've heard the, the children talk about, you know, how uh, before they moved into their new home, how that when they looked out their windows, they, they would see concrete and they'd see cars and they'd see shootings and, and things like that. And, and when we ask them what they see now, they, they talk about the grass and the birds out singing and being able to go out and play safely. And that's
あの素晴らしい演奏ができたと私たちもすごく嬉しく思っております。She said that it's even better to perform for you guys than in Japan to a Japanese audience. Okay, I had mentioned earlier that uh, we were here with Rich Giroux and talking about art visions and I've also talked a lot about the council having as one of its priorities promoting the arts and artists of, of Alabama. Um, our being able to have um, uh, productions that, that air on, on television are a real important way of, of reaching the public. Um, I think it provides an eye it, it, in, into some personalities, into some, some uh, uh, creative uh, visions of, of different artists that you don't normally see. We know what we like and we like what we know. And if we can know the arts better and know the artists better, then we're going to be that much more likely to go out to a theater performance or a symphony performance or go to an exhibit opening or go to a book reading or something like that. We're hoping that uh, uh, we can have more of these things around the state that, that air on a regular basis. Um, that, that using this vehicle and using this arm um, to, uh, to spotlight and showcase the arts is something we support and something we really hope to see more, more of in the, in the months and years to come. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I hope artists can find the information useful to them. This television series is the first TV series in Alabama for the arts, for creative visions, of all artists and the arts organizations in the state of Alabama. But it also includes humanity, civil rights, human rights, a big part of our lives.